do not already know. And having never been a mother and will never be a mother, I just believe that you probably know more about being a mother than I will ever even have any idea of knowing. But I do want to speak today on what I believe to be a very vital uh, and important topic, and that is God's countdown. Now, you may not even have thought about this, but there are countdowns going on every day all around us. For example, in the sports world, we recently had what is called by sports writers uh, March Madness. And what this amounts to is that they, NCAA picked the uh, best uh, teams in the country according to their record, 64 in number, and they were going to have a countdown or a playoff in order to reach that uh, bottom team, the one that was the very best in all the country. Well, they started out with 64, and then that number was reduced down to 32 after they played one another, and then from 32, the number came to be 16 because all the others had been defeated and eliminated from this particular process. Then it dropped to eight because four more were defeated. And then we have uh, from eight to four, and then down to two. And then when all was said and done, just one individual team, Louisville, was the best team in the country. Well, this is also done in baseball, and this countdown is going on now. And children, they already started a countdown till Christmas time. So that's the idea that I have in mind in presenting this lesson. When I think about God's countdown, I remember keeping up very closely when NASA was sending individuals into space and spaceship, uh, spaceships uh, abroad and into space. Well, I kept up with that very closely. And the most exciting time was when they got down to the last 10 seconds. And then they counted down 10, 9, 8, and so on until liftoff. And what a tremendous relief it was. When they did lift off and there were no accidents and people on board were safe and the mission was accomplished. What do all these countdowns really mean as it relates to eternity and salvation? Not one single thing. The countdowns that we have in this life are meaningless. But the countdown that I want to talk to you about, God's countdown, has every meaning and concern that we could possibly think about. Now let us assume for this particular lesson that God picks up the count at 10. And when we think about the number 10, we're thinking about the very beginning. And we're going to go from 10 down to zero in God's countdown. So let's begin by noting a few verses out of Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the waters, upon the face of the waters, and God said. Now, let me underscore and underline that particular sentence. God said. Only two words. But everything that followed after that is revealed to us in the Bible. That is why the Bible is such a great and wonderful book because it contains what God said. In the beginning, 
God created the heavens and the earth. Now, in order to save a little time, because we have a long way to go, I want to just uh, name in order the things that God did in the very early verses of Genesis. God's countdown, of course, begins with creation. There first was heaven and earth. Then there was life. And then there was firmament, or the the great expanse in which God created things. Then waters, dry land, grass, seasons, the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night, water creatures of every kind and description, fowl of all different kinds, and cattle and beasts, and finally man. It was on the sixth day that God created man. He took some dust from the earth, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's what Christians believe, and that's where we stand. We believe that God created every kind of and form of life that is now in existence. Well, the evolution just looks at us and laughs that we would believe such a thing as that. But they had rather us believe that all of these wonderful things that we are talking about, they just happen accidentally when all we have to do is just to think for a minute. Our world and everything that God created shows intelligent design. Somebody created these particular things, and that somebody is Almighty God. And this is where we stand as the people of God. But on the sixth day, God created man in his own image because he gave us a soul, and the soul of man will never die. We know that this old body is going to deteriorate over time, and eventually it will be no more. It will return to the dust from whence it came. But we know that God created within man a living soul, a soul that is going to live forever and never die. And from man, you remember, he took a rib from his side, and with this he created woman. What a marvelous thing. The power of God is so vast and so great that we can only make a feeble attempt in trying to describe the power of God. Then God provided a beautiful home for man and woman, Adam and Eve. And we know it was beautiful because everything that God did was the very best that could have been done. And so they had this beautiful home. And God gave them one simple command. And he said, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You can have all of these trees in the garden to eat from, but that one. Now, isn't that plain and isn't that simple? Just one little command like that. And man, had he behaved himself, had he obeyed God, he could have lived forever and continued to enjoy the blessings of God. In other words, it would be heaven here upon earth. But then there was the old devil that came upon the scene. Where did the devil come from? Probably a fallen angel. We don't really know, but he was there. And he persuaded Adam and Eve to go ahead and eat of the forbidden fruit. Even though God had specific, uh, specifically said, now don't you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But they could not keep this one command. 
And so God drove them out of the garden because God means what he says. When God told them not to eat of it because he said, the day you do that, you're going to die. He didn't necessarily mean that very day, but he meant the process of death would now be in effect. And when they ate of the forbidden fruit, God drove them out of the garden. You see, God is a very patient God, but there comes a time when God is no longer going to bear the sins of man. And he did not allow Adam and Eve to remain in that garden, but they lost access to this beautiful home. And from that time on, things went downhill. And people became so wicked that every imagination of man's heart was evil continually. Now imagine a world like that. Well, you don't have to do too much imagining. Just look how much the world has changed lately. Look at all the sins that are now condoned and looked upon as being okay and being right and God tolerates this or whatever a man believes, well, that's okay. Yeah, that's what's going on. And that's what was going on in Noah's day when God determined that he was going to destroy man from off the face of the earth. But thanks be to Noah, a godly man, or all of us wouldn't be here this morning. The world would have ended back then when every imagination of man's heart was so evil that God determined that he was going to destroy man from off the face of the earth. But there was Noah and his family. And of course, God does not punish the good with the bad. And you know, Noah, he believed God and he was a godly man and did what God told him to do. God told him to build an ark. What a foolish thing as man looks at it. In fact, we don't even know if there was any rain at this particular time or not. We're not told anything about it, but Noah was told to build an ark. And Noah did what God told him to do. He didn't question God. Well, God, what in the world do you want me to do this for? It doesn't make any sense to do something like this. God said, build the ark. And that's exactly what Noah did. He saved his house, uh, and that family was the only one saved from the destruction that God rendered at that particular time. Now, God uh, condemned the world and Noah and his family were the only ones saved. And then ten generations after the flood, God called a man by the name of Abraham. And this, of course, is where we end the count uh, ten. And this was known as the patri patriarchal age. And he made a number of wonderful promises to Abraham. He made a land promise. I'll show you a land that is flowing with milk and honey. And this, of course, was the land of Canaan that would eventually be occupied by the children of Israel. And he made him a national problem that in his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so God obviously saw in Abraham a man like Noah, a man that was a good man. And consequently, he blessed him and made him these wonderful promises. Now, what we have been talking about is the patriarchal age. And this period of time lasted for about 2,500 years. But now God drops the count to nine. And here Moses appears upon the scene. Moses truly was a great man, but he doubted his own ability. And you remember how Israel came enslaved down in the land of Egypt. Well, God called upon Moses to 
Come and deliver my people out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said, I just can't do it, Lord. I'm not an eloquent man. I can't speak. I can't do what you want me to do. But when God sets his mind to do something, he doesn't take no for an answer. He says, Aaron can be your spokesman. And so you remember how he sent Moses and Aaron, and they went down into the land of Egypt. And there appeared before the mighty Pharaoh and said, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh didn't listen. And it took 10 plagues upon the land of Egypt before Pharaoh finally realized God was the boss. God was the one that he had to answer to. And finally he relented and let the people of God go. But it didn't last very long. They were crossing the Red Sea and the waters had parted by a miracle from God and here was Pharaoh and his host pursuing them, trying to get them and bring them back into uh, the land of Egypt. And of course the waters engulfed Pharaoh and his host and they drowned in the sea. Now, those are the things that happen to a great extent during this particular time. But it was also during this time that God said that he was going to raise up a prophet. Now what was he talking about? Well, he was talking about Christ. Did you know there are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament about our Lord and about the work that he would do when he came into the world? And so this particular age in which Moses received the law of God, the first written law when he went up into the mountain, you remember, and got the law from God written on tables of stone. And that law was to guide those people back then and in that day to the time that the Lord would come. Uh, Moses truly said unto the prophets, The Lord your God shall raise up a man, and you shall hear him, and you shall listen to him, and do his bidding. In Galatians 3, 24 and 25, we read that the law, this is talking about the law that God gave to Moses, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under schoolmaster. Now this is just as plain as day. I couldn't say it any better. All of that particular period, was designed for one purpose, and that purpose was to bring Christ into the world. And it was during this particular time that all of these prophecies were made, as in Daniel 2.44, and in the days of those kings, Daniel said, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, and this kingdom will never be destroyed. Of course, that kingdom that he had reference to was the Lord's church. That's us. That's a, what he was talking about in the long ago. In Isaiah 2, verses 2 and 3, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And he was talking about uh, the word of God now in particular. The word of God will go forth from Jerusalem. And that's exactly what happened. Where was the first gospel sermon preached? It was in the city of Jerusalem. Well, this period of time is called the Mosaic Age. And I have just barely touched on these things and... I think you can understand if we're going to cover the ground that we need to, we have to move on. But now we drop to number eight. 
in God's countdown, the coming of our Lord into the world. And as I mentioned, all history pointed to the fact and truth that Christ would come into this world. His birth fulfilled prophecy. In Isaiah 7, 14, we're told that a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son, and his name would be called Jesus. Now imagine that a virgin would bear a son. You know what some translators have tried to do to get around what the truth of the matter is? So they have translated virgin as a woman. In other words, it could be just any woman. But that's not what the scriptures say. That's not what the Hebrew indicates in which the Old Testament was written. A virgin meant a virgin. It meant one who had not known man. A virgin will conceive and bring forth a son. And as we read in our New Testament, we all know that this is exactly what happened. Mary was, had not known man when suddenly, as a virgin, our Lord came into this world. Now many things happened during the ministry of Christ, and I can only touch on a few of them, but one of them was his baptism. He came to John who had been baptizing people in great numbers, and he requested to be baptized. And John said, well, Lord, I have need to be baptized of, of thee, and here you coming to me? But Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now don't tell me that baptism is not something we do because it's the right thing to do, because that's exactly what the Lord said. He was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Of course, he didn't have any sins. He lived a perfect life. But I believe the Lord knew that somewhere along the line there would be individuals who refused to be baptized and individuals who would say, well, the Lord wasn't baptized, so I'm not going to be baptized. Well, the Lord took care of that situation, and he was baptized of John in the Jordan River. And do you think for one minute that the Lord would do something that was non-essential or was not required by Almighty God? Of course not. We need to use what little sense God has given us to know and understand exactly what God's will is. Then a second thing happened. He preached the greatest sermon in human history, a sermon that has no equal. He used words this long. No, he didn't do that, did he? But just plain, simple, understanding language. Our Lord delivered the greatest sermon ever preached or ever even thought about by man. This is recorded in Matthew uh, 3, chapter, or Matthew 3 through 5 chapters. And what a tremendous sermon. It was. Then he performed a great number of miracles. Perhaps his greatest was raising Lazarus from the grave. Now keep in mind, Lazarus had been dead for three days. And his sisters, Mary and Martha, had sent for Jesus. He delayed his coming, I think for a purpose, wanting to show what he could do and his power. But when Jesus arrived at the home of Mary and Martha, Lazarus was gone. He died. He passed away. And so they went into the graveside of Lazarus. And our Lord said, Lazarus, come forth. And who do you think came forth? Lazarus. Our Lord proved that he could raise the dead. Now what does that say to each one of us? If the Lord raised Lazarus from the dead, then he can raise Bill Helm from the dead. He can raise each one of us 
from the dead because he has that power. Now that's just one of the miracles that he performed. You know, John and his last chapter in the Gospel of John, he was talking about the miracles of God, and here's what John said. I suppose that if all the miracles that were done by the Lord, if we had all of those recorded, not even the world would hold the books. Now what John was doing was using a hyperbole he was using an exaggeration to emphasize the importance of the miracles that our Lord performed. The world wouldn't even hold the books. Now notice he said, I suppose. In other words, he was not speaking this as an exact fact, but he was simply pointing out our Lord performed any number of miracles and any kind of miracle that he wanted to perform. That's what he meant, and that's exactly what he did. There was no miracle that the Lord could not perform. Then let me mention the encounter he had with the devil himself, one-on-one, -on -one. and the devil did everything within his power to overcome the Lord. And he tried to get Jesus to turn stone into bread. And he tried to, took him to the, the pinnacle of the temple and told him to cast himself down. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. He said, all of these will be yours. He did everything within his power to overcome and win a victory over the Lord. And had he been successful, I wouldn't be up here this morning and preaching to you what a person needs to do, and I'll mention later, in order to be saved, because the Lord would have lost the battle with the devil, one on one, but Jesus was victorious and resisted every temptation. You know what he said? And this is a lesson here, a powerful lesson to each one of us. Whenever the devil attempted him on all three occasions, he said three words. It is written. That is all you need to refute every error under the sun. It is written. But if you don't know what's written, how can you Tell somebody else what is written. But that is the power in the word of God. It is written. Oh, whenever you hear error, just say it is written and tell them what the truth of the matter is. And then during the lifetime of our Lord, he made this great and wonderful promise. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. Now, the rock was a confession that Peter had made. Jesus had said, well, whom do men say that I am? And they enumerated a number of the prophets and different things. Well, they were all wrong, of course. And then Jesus said, well, whom do ye say that I am? In other words, who do you apostles say that I am? And without hesitation, it was no denial on Peter's part at this time. And he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the confession that most of the people in this audience have made. What a beautiful and wonderful confession. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And this is the confession we have to make in order to be saved. So upon this truth, that I am the Son of God, I will build my church. These hundreds of denominational churches out here, the Lord built those? No. He said, I'll build my church. It belongs to me. And that's the only one I'm going to build. And pray tell me, what do we need with a multiplicity of churches? When the Lord said, my church is sufficient. 
on this rock I will build my church. Well, those are some of the things that happen under the count of eight. But now we're down to seven. The count dropped to seven with the death of Christ. And it's appropriate that the number seven be used here because in the Bible, you know what that number means? It means completeness. And how complete it was when our Lord died. He had accomplished his purpose for, for coming into this world. And he died on the cross for our sins. And the death of Christ gave us the three great facts of the gospel. The death, the burial, and resurrection of the Son of God. And you know when we think about these three facts of the gospel, it gives meaning to baptism. Many people don't know what baptism is all about. But we are simply told in Romans 6, 3, and 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And then we are raised to walk in newness of life. Now think about the facts of the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And in baptism, we participate, we actually participate in the death of Christ because we are buried like our Lord was buried. And then we are raised like our Lord was raised. The Lord was raised never to die again. And we are raised to walk in newness of life with all of those old past sins behind us. And you tell me that baptism is non-essential? What have you done with your Bible? What have you read in your Bible? It's there as plain as day. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ we participate in that when we are baptized for the remission or forgiveness of our sin. And during this particular time, when our Lord uh, was raised from the dead and just before he ascended, he assured the disciples, he said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am. There ye may be also. Now the count drops to number five. Now the Lord, you remember, had said, I will build my church. Now it's going to be a reality. It was on the day of Pentecost. People had gathered there from every nation under heaven at that particular time. Thousands of people. We don't know the number. But it was on that occasion that the apostles of the Lord preached the gospel of Christ for the first time because this was the beginning of the Christian age. And it was on that particular day as Peter was powerfully proclaiming God's truth that the Jews who had taken a part in actually crucifying the Son of God they were cut to their heart by the word of God and cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? And here is God's answer. It is not my answer. It is not the answer of some member of the church of Christ. It is the answer that comes from God. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin. Now you can't get it any plainer than that. So don't tell me that baptism is not for the remission of sin. That's exactly what it's for. That the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ is imitated and we are raised to walk in newness of life. Well, the count now drops to five. There is a great falling away. Here the church is established, it is built, and it's going good, and Paul is doing everything within his power to keep it going. But men are departing 
from God's truth. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart, depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall heap to themselves teachers Having each and ears, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. And that falling away, that's where we are right now, has culminated in denominationalism that we have on every hand. Now remember Paul said, of your own selves, he said, the time is coming. It's here, Paul. The count of five is going on. Men have departed from the truth. They have departed by the name they wear, the doctrine they teach, and the organization of the particular church. Dom denominationalism rules the day. And we have preachers who are not willing to proclaim the truth anymore. God's word must be preached. There is no substitute for it. And thankfully we have a preacher here who will preach the truth. Then we get to number four. This is death. Death comes to every last one of us. As long as the world stands, the world may end before some die, but with that exception, Everyone must die. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then cometh the judgment. I think about all the good, faithful preachers that I have known who have passed away. How greatly we need them now. Guy and Woods, Gus Nichols, N.B. Hardiman, 4E Wallace, Jr., H.A. Dixon, Betzel Barrett Baxter, G.C. Brewer. We greatly need men like this who will proclaim God's word. Death came to them even though they could preach and teach and the world was listening and they were seeking to restore the church as it existed in the first century. But now they're gone. And it is left up to those of us who are living today to continue to preach God's truth and restore the church as it existed in the first century. And you know, we don't have to have church succession. Read the article I wrote in the bulletin. But it's not being able to trace ourselves back to the church of the New Testament. But it's whether or not we're willing to sow the seed of the kingdom. And when we sow God's seed in the 21st century, it will produce the very same church that we have back in the Bible that we read about the New Testament church. The same seed. It's like if all the wheat crops were destroyed, there was no more wheat crops on the face of the earth, but I had a handful of wheat seed. And I planted that seed. What would it produce? The very same wheat that was destroyed. And that's our duty. That's our responsibility. To sow the seed of the kingdom. God doesn't hold us accountable for results because we are greatly failing in that area. But he does hold us accountable for sowing the right kind of seed. Because seed always produces after its own kind. You can't sow a tomato seed and get some potatoes. It just doesn't happen that way. You can't preach the word of God without getting a New Testament church by those who respond to the invitation. Well, let's go on to number three. Count drops to number three. And that is the coming of Christ. There are three things I want to note here. 
His account will be audible. He will descend from heaven with a shout, a shout that will be heard around the world. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 It will be a visible coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and even those who pierced his side, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And it will be a personal coming. As our Lord told uh, men that were standing by as he ascended, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus shall so come again in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And God will at this time send his son. It's up to God. The very idea that men think they're so smart that they can predict the time the Lord will come, how foolish. Because of that day and hour, no, no man, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But think of the stupidity of man. Thinking he can predict the very day when Christ comes. How many days does that happen? How many times does that happen that the day was predicted? I don't know, but I know they were all wrong and will continue to be wrong. But now we're down to two. We have the resurrection. The hour cometh in which all that in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. Some in the grave, no, all. It doesn't matter where a person dies, maybe at the bottom of a sea somewhere, God knows. And in the great resurrection day, all will come forth. They that have done good unto life, and they that have done evil unto condemnation. And this is talked about in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And Paul said, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the sound of the trump, the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now we're down to number one, the judgment day. It is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Just as sure as you're seated here in this auditorium this morning, one day you will be standing before the judgment bar of God to be judged. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, we have there with Christ seated on the throne. He is going to be the judge, and he's going to separate the people. Come ye blessed of my Father, he's going to say, inherit the kingdom or depart from me. I know you not. He'll separate us as a shepherd would divide the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. And all of that will be determined by the very lives that you are now living here upon this earth. But we will all face the judgment. Down to zero. Eternity. How can you describe eternity? I have no idea. I've heard a lot of preachers attempt to describe it, and I've tried a few myself, but they're all inaccurate. Eternity has no ending. Eternity had no beginning. Can we comprehend it and understand it? Of course not. But eternity goes on. In Ecclesiastes 12.5, it's called a long home. Yes, it is long and will last forever. So it's going to be comfort or it's going to be misery. It counts. When it reaches zero, it's all over. Eternity. And only you can decide where you're going to be when that day comes. Stand together as we sing the invitation song.